Adapted from Archaic Translation by H. T. Francis and R. A. Neil. J. Taka No. 433. Lamasakashyapa J. Taka. A King Like Indra, etc. This story the master living at Jitavana Monastery told concerning a worldly-minded brother. The master asked him if he were longing for the world, and when he admitted that it was so, the master said, Brother, even men of the highest fame sometimes incur condemnation. Sins like these defile even pure beings. Much more one like you. And then he told a story of the past. Once upon a time Prince Brahmadatta, son of Brahmadatta king of Banaras, and the son of his family priest named Kashyapa, were schoolmates and learned all the sciences in the house of the same teacher. In due course of time the young prince on his father's death was established in the kingdom. Kashyapa thought, my friend has become king. He will give great power to me. What have I to do with power? I will take leave of the king and my parents, and become an ascetic. So he went into the Himalayas and adopted the religious life, and on the seventh day he entered on the faculties and attainments, and gained his living by what he got leftovers in the fields. And men nicknamed the ascetic Lumasakashyapa. With his senses mortified he became an ascetic of grim austerity. And by virtue of his austerity the dwelling of Sakha was shaken. Sakha, thinking on the cause, observed him and thought, this ascetic, by the exceedingly fierce fire of his virtue, would make me fall even from the dwelling of Sakha. After a secret interview with the king of Banaras, I will break down his austerity. By the power of Asaka he entered the royal chamber of the king of Banaras at midnight and illuminated all the chamber with the radiance of his form. And standing in the air before the king he woke him up and said, Sire, arise, and when the king asked, Who are you? He answered, I am Sokka. For which reason are you come? Sire, do you desire or not sole rule in all India? Of course I do. So Sokka said, Then bring Luma Sakashyapa here and ask him to offer a sacrifice of killed beasts. And you shall become, like Sokka, exempt from old age and death, and exercise rule throughout all India, and he repeated the first stanza. A king like Indra you shall be. Never doomed old age or death to see. Should Kashyapa buy over advice? Offer a living sacrifice. On hearing his words the king readily agreed. Sokka said, then make no delay, and so departed. Next day the king summoned a counselor named Seha and said, Good sir, go to my dear friend Luma Sakashyapa and in my name speak thus to him. The king by persuading you to offer a sacrifice will become sole ruler in all India, and he will grant you as much land as you desire. Come with me to offer sacrifice. He answered. Very well. Sire and made proclamation by beat of drum to learn the place where the ascetic lived. And when a certain forester said, I know, Seha went there under his guidance with a large following, and saluting the sage sat respectfully on one side and delivered his message. Then he said to him, Seha, what is this you say? And refusing him he spoke these four stanzas. No island realm, safeguarded in the sea, shall tempt me, Seha, to this cruelty. A curse upon the lust of fame and gain. From where spring the sins that lead to endless pain. Better, as ascetic one, to beg one's bread. Than by a crime bring shame upon my head. Yes better, bowl in hand, to flee from sin. Than by such cruelty a kingdom win. The counselor, after hearing what he said, went and told the king. Thought the king, should he refuse to come, what can I do? and kept silent. But Sokka at midnight came and stood in the air and said, Why, sire, do you not send for Luma Sakashyapa and ask him to offer sacrifice? When he is sent for, he refuses to come. Sire, adorn your daughter, Princess Shandavati, and send her by the hand of Seha and ask him to say, If you will come and offer sacrifice, the king will give you this girl to wife. Clearly he will be struck with love of the girl and will come. The king readily agreed, and next day sent his daughter by the hand of Seha. Seha took the king's daughter and went there. 
and after the usual salutation and compliments to the sage, he presented to him the princess, as lovely as a celestial nymph, and stood at a respectful distance. The ascetic losing his moral sense looked at her, and with the mere look he fell away from meditation. The counselor seeing that he was overcome with love said, Your reverence, if you will offer sacrifice, the king will give you this girl to wife. He trembled with the power of passion and said, Will he surely give her to me? Yes, if you offer sacrifice, he will. Very well, he said, if I get her, I will sacrifice, and taking her with him, just as he was, ascetic locks and all, he mounted a splendid chariot and went to Benares. But the king, as soon as he heard he was certainly coming, prepared for the ceremony in the sacrificial pit. So when he saw that he was come, he said, If you offer sacrifice, I shall become equal to Indra, and when the sacrifice is completed, I will give you my daughter. Kashyapa readily agreed. So the king next day went with Shandavati to the sacrificial pit. There all four-footed beasts, elephants, horses, bulls, and the rest were placed in a line. Kashyapa tried to offer sacrifice by killing and killing them all. Then the people that were gathered together there said, This is not proper or befitting you, Lumasakashyapa. Why do you act thus? And morning they uttered two stanzas. Both sun and moon bear potent sway. And tides no power on earth can stay. Brahmins and priests almighty are. But womankind is mightier far. Even so Shandavati did win. Grim Kashyapa to deadly sin. And urged him by her sire's clever means. To offer living sacrifices. At this moment Kashyapa, to offer sacrifice, lifted up his precious sword to strike the royal elephant on the neck. The elephant at the sight of the sword, terrified with the fear of death, uttered a loud cry. On hearing his cry the other beasts too, elephants, horses, and bulls through fear of death uttered loud cries, and the people also cried aloud. Kashyapa, on hearing these loud cries, grew excited and thought on his matted hair. Then he became conscious of matted locks and beard, and the hair upon his body and breast. Full of remorse he cried, Alas! I have done a sinful deed, unbecoming my character, and showing his emotion he spoke the eighth stanza. This cruel act is of desire the fruit. The growth of lust I'll cut down to the root. Then the king said, Friend, fear not. Offer the sacrifice, and I will now give you the princess Shandavati, and my kingdom and a pile of the seven treasures. On hearing this Kashyapa said, Sire, I do not want this sin upon my soul and spoke the concluding stanza. Curse on the lusts upon this earth so prevalent. Better by far than these the ascetic life. I will forsaking sin a hermit be. Keep your realm and fair shandavity. With these words he concentrated his thoughts on the mystic object. And recovering the lost idea sat cross-legged in the air. Teaching the law to the king, and, advising him to be zealous in good works, he told him to destroy the sacrificial pit and grant an amnesty to the people. And at the king's request, flying up into the air he returned to his own dwelling. And as long as he lived, he cultivated the Brahma perfections and became destined to birth in the Brahma world. The master having ended his lesson revealed the truths and identified the birth. At the conclusion of the truths the worldly-minded brother attained to sainthood. In those days the great counselor Seha was Sariputra, Lumasakashyapa was myself. Source Adapted from Archaic Translation by H. T. Francis and R. A. Neil. J. Taka No. 434. Kakavaka J. Taka. Twin pair of birds, etc. This story the master living at Jitavana Monastery told concerning a greedy brother. He was. It was said. Greedy after the Buddhist necessities and throwing off all duties of master and pastor. Entered Shravasthi city quite early. And after drinking excellent rice porridge served with many a kind of solid food in the house of Vizaka. And after eating in the daytime various choice foods. Patty, meat and boiled rice. Not satisfied with this he goes about from there to the house of Kulahanathapandika, and the king of Kosala, and various others. 
so one day a discussion was raised in the Hall of Truth concerning his greediness. When the master heard what they were discussing, he sent for that brother and asked him if it were true that he was greedy. And when he said yes, the master asked, Why, brother, are you greedy? Formerly too through your greediness, not being satisfied with the dead bodies of elephants, you left Banaras and wandering about on the bank of the Ganges, entered the Himalaya country. And on this he told a story of the past. Once upon a time when Brahmadatta was reigning in Banaras, a greedy crow went about eating the bodies of dead elephants. And not satisfied with them he thought, I will eat the fat of fish on the bank of the Ganges, and after staying a few days there eating dead fish he went into the Himalaya and lived on various kinds of wild fruits. Coming to a large lotus tank exceeding in fish and turtles, he saw there two golden-colored geese who lived on the Sevala plant. He thought, these birds are very beautiful and well-favored. Their food must be delightful. I will ask them what it is, and by eating the same I too shall become golden-colored. So he went to them, and after the usual kindly greetings to them as they sat perched on the end of a branch, he spoke the first stanza in relation with their praises. Twin pair of birds in yellow dressed. So joyous roaming to and fro. What kind of birds do men love best? This is what I am glad to know. The red goose on hearing this spoke the second stanza. O bird, of humankind the pest. We above other birds are blessed. All lands with our devotion ring. And men and birds our praises sing. Know then that red geese are we. And fearless wander over the seat. Hearing this the crow spoke the third stanza. What fruits upon the sea are many? And from where may flesh for geese be found? Say on what heavenly food you live. Such beauty and such strength to give. Then the red goose spoke the fourth stanza. No fruits are on the sea to eat. And from where should red geese have meat? Savala plant, stripped of its skin. Yields food without a taint of sin. Then the crow spoke two stanzas. I like not, goose, the words you use. I once believed the food we choose. To nourish us, should agree. With what our outward form might be. But now I doubt it, for I eat. Rice, salt, and oil, and fruit, and meat. As heroes feast returned from fight. So I too in good cheer delight. But though I live on elegant food. My looks with yours may not compare. Then the red goose told the reason why the crow failed to attain to personal beauty, while he himself attained to it, and spoke the remaining stanzas. Not satisfied with fruit, or garbage found. Within the premises of the charnel ground. The greedy crow pursues in meaningless flight. The casual prey that tempts his appetite. But all that thus shall work their wicked will and for their pleasure harmless creatures kill. Reprimanded by their conscience, wither away. And see their strength and comeliness decay. So happy beings that no creatures harm. In form gain vigor and in looks a charm. For beauty surely be it understood. Depends not wholly on the kind of food. Thus did the red goose in many ways rebuke the crow. And the crow having brought this rebuke upon himself said, I want not your beauty. And with a cry of ka, ka, he flew away. The master, his lesson ended, revealed the truths and identified the birth. At the conclusion of the truths the greedy brother attained to fruition of the second path. In those days the crow was the greedy brother, the she-goose was the mother of Rahul, the he-goose myself.